All right, this morning I'm going to be preaching on the subject of baptism. So I like going through doctrinal sermons from time to time, just make sure that we uh, keep the fundamentals secure and we know exactly why we believe what we believe. And um, since we were having a baptism after church service this morning, so it just kind of prompted me to think like, hey, I might as well teach on this and preach on this. You definitely need to keep hitting things. So, you know, many of you, this may not be brand new at all. Um, it should be something that hopefully you're already solid in, but, but we, like I said, you ought to be able to, especially with the fundamentals, be able to explain exactly why you believe what you believe. People have differences of opinion about these different things, and I'm going to be talking about what baptism is and what it is not. And I'm going to start off, you, you could keep a bookmark in Romans 6. We're going to go back to that chapter later. Uh, we read the entire chapter out loud because it, almost the entire chapter is just uh, gives us a lot of the understanding of baptism. So we'll get to that later. But I want to start off by saying that what baptism is not, and primarily what baptism is not, is not required for salvation. Baptism is not a requirement for salvation at all, Amen. okay? And no, not even, you know, people say, oh, you'll be baptized in the Holy Ghost. No, that is not required for salvation. What's required for salvation is exactly what the Bible says is required for salvation, where it says they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. For whosoever believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on with all the verses that explain that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. That is what saves. It has nothing to do with a water baptism whatsoever. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 4, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And one of the things I find kind of interesting is the same people that want to tell you that you must be baptized in order to be saved are the same people that believe that you could lose your salvation and then you could get it back and you could lose your salvation and you could get it back. Well, if, if baptism would be necessary, then why is there just one baptism? Right? And, you know, there ought to just be, there is just one baptism. The Bible teaches that there's one baptism. We don't need to get baptized over and over and over again, just like you don't need to get saved over and over and over again. Okay, you get baptized once. Now, there is a prerequisite for baptism. Turn, if you would, to Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8, we're going to read near the very end of the chapter there, the last few verses. Story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So there's a man riding in a carriage, and he's traveling along. And Philip sees his carriage, and the Lord's like telling Philip to, hey, go, go and talk to this person that's in that carriage. So he's prompted of the Holy Ghost to go and speak to this person. He ends up catching up with him, and it says there in verse number 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. This guy was unsaved. He didn't know what he was reading. He didn't understand it. He was trying to figure out what the Bible was saying. Philip shows up to open up the scripture to him, and he started preaching unto him Jesus, because that's what he needs to hear about to get saved, right? Verse 36, And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he's saying, well, wa there's water right there. Why can't I be baptized? Now, the reason why he's even asking about baptism at all is because he already knew that there's, a, there's these people that are called Christians that are getting baptized, right? It was something that's well known. Even today in modern society, if people don't, uh, you know, non-believers, just people out in the world, they know that baptism is a thing by and large. 
right? Most people understand that there's this thing called baptism. Even if they don't understand all about it, they don't really understand what it means, they know that it exists, and they know that Christians do this, and they get baptized. So it's not, it's not weird to think that there may be someone out there who's going to say, well, hey, well, I want to be baptized. He starts hearing all this stuff about Jesus, and he's going, well, hey, that sounds great. Hey, I want to be baptized. Why can't I be baptized? Right? And at this point, He's receiving what Philip is saying, so he's going, great, hey, there's water right there. I want to get baptized. Well, there's a prerequisite. What, what hinders me? What is it that's going to prevent me from being baptized, Philip? Verse 37, and Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So there is a prerequisite to getting baptized. You have to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all of your heart as your personal Savior. That is the prerequisite. This is very important on what baptism is, what it isn't. Baptism, it's a believer's baptism. It's something that only we perform on those who believe. So everyone who gets baptized by me in this church, I'm going to ask you about your salvation before I do any baptisms. So... Because the, the, the point is, well, hey, if, you, if a person doesn't believe, then why would I baptize them? That's just going to give them some false ideas if someone's not even trusting Christ or if they're believing in a works-based salvation or they think they could lose their salvation, things like this. That's not going to do any good. Okay? And we'll, we'll understand a little bit more about that when we see the, the full picture of, of baptism anyways. But what else is interesting about this passage, particularly right here, you know, we just read the answer in verse number 37. And if you ever wonder, if you're new to our church, if you're visiting and you say, you notice that we're reading from the King James Version of the Bible, the these and the thous, you say, well, what does hinder me? I go, that just sounds funny, Pastor Bersons. I don't think I can understand that. Well, that's why I'm up here preaching and helping explaining it to you, first of all. Second of all, it's not that difficult to understand. It's not that old, and any parts of the Bible are difficult to understand. You know, you can pray to God, you could, you could ask, you could get some help on that. But here's why it's so important, here's why I'm making a big deal out of it. I, don't, I do have, an, I have a non-inspired version right here, also known as the NIV. And this is why this is important, okay? And, and look... I am mocking and I'm going to ridicule these other versions of the Bible because they're not God's word. They falsely put Bible on here or Holy Bible. Okay, that, that is a misnomer. That is not accurate. That is not correct. They are perversions of the word of God because they have changed the word of God in very, very, very significant ways. Not just a minor, oh, well, this says doth and that says does and this says thou and that one says you. That's the way the sellers of this book want to sell it to you. But that's not that what actually is the case when you look at it. And the reason why I'm stopping and taking so much time on this right here is because I'm teaching on baptism. Look, this is a critical point verse, in verse 37 there, if you believe with all thine heart. Number one, because we have tons of people out there who are baptizing babies. They're baptizing babies. Now you tell me, can a newborn, a, a one-week-old, a six-week-old, a six-month-old, can they put their faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? They don't understand anything about it. They don't know right from wrong. They don't know good and evil. They don't know these things. And I'll tell you this much, too. They don't need to be saved because they haven't committed sin yet. They are innocent. They are pure. Okay, and if, and if an infant dies, they go straight to heaven. But see, when people who get their, their salvation wrong, they also get the, a lot of other things wrong, too. So when you start thinking, like, oh, man, well, what's my baby going to do? They didn't do any of these sacraments, or they didn't do this other stuff, so they introduced it. Oh, let's just baptize them to make sure that they go to heaven with it. Look, that's not, that's false. That's false. You must believe in order to be baptized. Now, in this non-inspired version that I have, I'll read this for you. You could look down at the real Bible. And, you know, they always, ha they don't have the verses ever in these, in these modern versions. It's like paragraph style, so you've got these numbering all throughout. It's kind of hard to even see the numbers, whereas the King James Bible, I mean, 
I, I know there's other editions that may put them as paragraph style, but by and large, they are the traditional, you've got each verse number going down to be able to reference and easily reference the scriptures. You know, people who actually use the Bible and study the Bible and want to teach the Bible, it's great to have an easy reference to be able to find a verse that you know, oh, I know what this verse is, I know where that verse is. It's a lot harder in these other paragraph style ones, but it's also easier to obfuscate or to, to cover up what has been done and the verses that have been removed when it's in a paragraph form. And in this book that I'm holding in my hand, their verse 36 says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? That's almost the same thing as what we just read. And I'm going to keep reading. And he ordered the chariot to stop. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. I didn't accidentally, my eyes didn't skip over verse 37. It's, it's just not there. Okay, and if you, you could see this for yourself after service, if you don't believe me, it goes, and, it, and it's numbered 36, 38. <laughs> Isn't it funny that they're following the King James verse numbering? If you didn't think it belongs there, why don't you change the numbering? Why would you number a verse that way? What you read is important, but look, okay, I'm going to get back onto the baptism side of things because this is really important, but, but what the Bible that you read, it's a whole other sermon for another day, but it's very important, and this is just one of the many, many, many examples as to where there are major significant problems with the modern versions. That, that's a, you can't just take away from God's word, and it doesn't even make sense to ask a question and then not have an answer. Because he asked a question and said, well, hey, why can't I be baptized? And then you just baptize them. So apparently there is no reason why a person can't get baptized. And that's ridiculous. You mean to tell me that Philip's there preaching the gospel to him, and this guy asks him a question and says, hey, why can't I be baptized? And Philip just doesn't say anything, and he says, stop the chariot, and then just baptizes him. <laughs> he doesn't even give him an answer. Like, that's ridiculous. Those modern perversions are ridiculous, though. So we see here, Philip baptizes him, and then, and then he leaves. And turn, turn if you to Mark chapter 16, because I, I wanted to show you, look, there's a condition for baptism. That's part of what it is. I want to go back to, because I didn't cover this really well, what it is not. And, and I, I mentioned before about salvation. There, are, there is verse after verse after verse that talks about believing being the requirement for salvation, and baptism isn't even mentioned anywhere in the passage. John 5.24 is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, uh, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and uh, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. No word of baptism there, but it gives us that clear, hey, if you believe, you have everlasting life. You have eternal life. You will not be condemned. In the future, you shall not be condemned. You're not going to go to hell. You've already passed from death unto life. Past, present, future, you're saved. Done. Sealed. Amen. 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 But those that want to try to teach that baptism is required for salvation, they may turn to a passage like Mark 16. Which again, just on that, that other side note of, uh, of the modern scriptures, so-called, the, the modern perversion of the Bible, they'll tell you that basically almost the entire, last, the entire last portion of the book of Mark just shouldn't even be there. That it's not reliable. But then they're going to turn to this passage to try to prove uh, that you need to be baptized, right? It's, uh, it, it, they, they pick and choose when is it convenient to have this as part of the Bible and when is it not. But look at verse number 15. Powerful passage. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. 
Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen. Okay, that's a very true verse, a very true statement. The problem is that people want to butcher this and change this into meaning something that it doesn't when it's simply a true statement. And part of this has to do with just understanding logic and reasoning and just understanding how things make sense and just kind of using reasoning to understand what this says and what it does not say. Now, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is that a true statement? Yes. Yes. Does this say you must be baptized to be saved? It does not say that. It just says he, a person, that believeth and is baptized. Well, wait, I'm, I believe and I'm baptized. So I'm saved, right? Yes, I'm saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Here's the logic part of this. If you have a true statement, because elsewhere in the Bible you have, he that believeth shall be saved. Yep. As I just quoted from John chapter 5, verse 24. Amen. And many verses where it's just believe. The believing is what saved. You could add anything after that, and it's still a true statement, and it's not misleading, and I'll get to that in just a second. It's not misleading at all when you just read this. Hey, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes and goes to church shall be saved. He that believes and prays to God shall be saved. He that believes and stands on their head shall be saved. Because he that believes shall be saved. You could add anything to that, but the problem comes in is when you start trusting that, no, you must, I must believe in my baptism to save me. That's a problem. Because how does the, the rest of this verse go? But he that believeth not shall be damned. No mention of baptism on the damned part. People are either saved or damned. Okay? So even within the context of this one verse, well, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So what does that mean for the person that believes and is not baptized? Are they damned? Well, no, because he that believeth not shall be damned. So he does believe. So he can't be damned. The verse answers it itself. He that believeth, and you say, well, well I'm not baptized, but I believe, you're still saved because we can point to many, many other passages that prove that also clearly as well. John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. I just want to briefly cover some of these points that people will try to make when they try to teach the false doctrine of uh, baptismal regeneration is what it may be called by some, or just the fact that you would need to be baptized in the New Testament in order to be saved. It is a falsehood. It is a lie. And anyone who's trusting in their baptism as part of their salvation is not saved. This is why I teach as a preacher, because it's that important. If you're trusting that your baptism plays some part in your salvation, that is a work. That is something that is, you know, you, you, that, what that means is you're not trusting in Christ with all of your heart. Because one part of your heart is trusting in that baptism that you did also. We need to trust Jesus 100%. Not any aspect of keeping the law. Not any, you know, and, and ultimately, baptism is a commandment, by the way, too. They commanded people to be baptized after they got saved. No ordinance, no no. Nothing else is required for salvation other than faith in Christ. John chapter 3. We're going to start reading verse number 3. This is Jesus speaking with Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse 3. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Now I'm going to point out here, there's three places in this passage that talk about this new birth. Okay, first of all, verse 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you are not saved if you are not born again. Now, by virtue of being born again, that means you must have a first birth in order to have a second birth, right? Born again implies there is a first and a second birth. Keep that in mind as we continue this conversation that we're reading between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus saith unto him, 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's just thinking physical, completely. I have one birth, sure, we all have one birth. I have a birthday. My birthday is April 23rd. You know, everyone has a different birthday. So he's saying, but I'm a grown man. How am I going to be born again? This is physically impossible, right? So Jesus clarifies in verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he clarifies, first of all, I think this should be obvious to everyone, that the born again is a spiritual birth, not a physical birth. But what's also important to understand is that he's continuing to compare a physical is first, spiritual second. Physical first, spiritual second. We all in this world have a physical birth, but not everybody has the second birth, the spiritual birth, which is what you must have in order to see the kingdom of heaven. So in verse 5, when he says, except a man be born of water and of the spirit... That's a first birth and a second birth. There are people out there who want to tell you, well, being born of water means that's baptism. Why is that baptism? People who want to teach that is because they already have a preconceived idea that you must be baptized to be saved. You don't get that understanding from this passage just by reading it. Born of means born from. If you're born from the Spirit, right, the Spirit is what brings you life, right? It's the Spirit of God when you get saved, when you have that spiritual birth. Being born from the water is that passage through the physical birth canal into this world when a mother's water breaks and then out comes the baby. It's very simple to understand, and this can be proven by that next verse in verse 6, where again he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Flesh, spirit. Water, spirit. Flesh, spirit. Water, spirit. Born again. Physical birth always comes first. Born of water means born of the flesh. I, I, it, it's clearly in Scripture. Anyone with spiritual discernment should be able to see that that's, that's what this is teaching. This is what this is saying. Now, maybe you've been deceived in the past. I understand that. People are good at, at taking things out of context. But when you compare it with continuing going through the context, it makes sense. Now, we're going to keep reading this passage here. Um, verse number 7 says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And now here is the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? Nicodemus doesn't understand this at all. Well, how can this even be? Verse 10 is, is the last point I want to make here. Jesus answered and said unto him, art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? The concept of being born again should not have been a new concept for Nicodemus. Otherwise, why would Jesus rebuke someone for not knowing something if it was impossible for that person to have even have known of those things? Right? I mean, why, why would he do that? Why, why would he rebuke someone? Say, oh, how could you not know what these things are? How could you not know this already? You're a master of Israel. Why do I make a point of that? Because people will try to tell you that, well, salvation was different in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and baptism is a New Testament thing. Well, he's explaining to them being born again, which this isn't about baptism. This is about being born again, but he's showing him that salvation is, uh, is the second birth. It's, it's a new birth. It's being born again, and the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, in John chapter 1, verse 12. That second birth comes by believing on Christ. That's when you're born again. 
people in the Old Testament, they didn't know the name of Christ, but they still believed in the Savior to come. They believed in a Messiah. They believed in he that would come and take away the sins of the world. That new covenant was already professed in the Old Testament that it was coming, and they put their faith in that for their salvation. They put faith in a Savior, even though they didn't know his name. Now we know the name. Now we know it's Jesus Christ. So we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Why am I bringing that up? Because we have examples even of someone being saved in the Bible that clearly was not baptized when we look at the thief on the cross. Very clear evidence. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Oh, well, that's an exception. Oh, look, we don't, God doesn't make exceptions. It's not like, oh, well, the rules are okay for you, but not, it's for, for good for everyone else, but not for you. Either, either baptism is required for everyone or it's not. And they just want to throw that verse away and throw that whole story away. Oh, do you, he's just showing extra forgiveness or something. That's ridiculous. How, how is that just? See, justice is you keep everyone to the same standard. And you're not a respecter of persons. If, if Jesus were just offering this extra special forgiveness on the thief on the cross, well, you don't need to be baptized. Well, what, why would he be any different than anyone else? Then how could you hold anyone to that standard? Well, why don't you show me that forgiveness? Why don't you, you know, like, no, God is a God of justice. God is the perfect holy judge, and he's going to judge things appropriately. Um, at the end of time, the only way that people get, can escape that judgment is by being saved through Christ. Also, I mean, if, if baptism was required for salvation, why would one of the greatest apostles that's ever walked the earth, the Apostle Paul, in my opinion, one of the greatest, used mightily with all the revelations of God, giving us so much of the New Testament through his epistles to these churches, why would he say this in 1 Corinthians 1.17, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Well, apparently God doesn't really want people getting saved. He just wants them hearing the gospel. That makes no sense. If you have an evangelist going around to preach people the gospel so that they could be led to Christ and get saved, why wouldn't he also be baptizing? Yeah. If, if the baptism was required for salvation. It's not required for salvation. That's, that's the easy answer. That's the most obvious answer. That's the truthful answer. People were saved the same way in the Old Testament as new. But the figure of baptism was present. I want to touch on this also in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We flip over to chapter 10. We've got to understand, the, most of the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of the new. The Old Covenant, while it was a glorious covenant, was completely outshined by the New Covenant. We, we covered that when we went through our Bible study in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews shows a lot of the differences between the Old and the New Covenant and how much better it is. But the, the things that are written in the Old Covenant, the things that are written in the Old Testament, the Bible says they're written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. There's a lot of great learning, teaching, doctrine, many things we can learn from the Old Testament. But what we see most of all, and probably most importantly, are all the foreshadowing of the things to come. All of the prophecies. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. This is talking about when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, from slavery into freedom. It says they were all under the cloud, they all passed through the sea. Because remember, God appeared unto them at a pillar of fire by night and a, and, a, and a cloudy pillar by day. Verse 2 says, And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud 
and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, remember that manna, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. All of the spiritual teachings now are being shown from the events that literally happened when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, but they were all done to show a greater spiritual meaning behind the actual physical events that happened. And he's showing how, you know, they were delivered from Egypt when Moses led them out of Egypt, but then they were still being pursued by the enemy, and then they get to the sea, and they were baptized by the cloud and the sea when they, when they passed over um, into the wilderness and then continued on their journey to the promised land. But it's showing that spiritual meat, that manna that they got, is also representative of the body of Christ. Um, the, the drink that they drank, it's, it's just like Jesus was talking to the woman at the well saying, hey, you know, I've got water to give you that if you drink, you'll never be thirsty again. And he, he's talking about the same spiritual drink just as the children of Israel, the Bible says, that they drank of. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Further illustrating salvation in the Old Testament, even through Christ, even though they didn't know his name, Christ was that rock Amen. that brought forth the living waters. Now, physically, these events happen to them, but it's showing that greater truth. 1 Peter chapter 3, let's turn there real quick. Hopefully we're clearing up any, if there's any misunderstanding, even about just one particular passage, especially the ones that, that refer to baptism, that we get this straight. But we understand... I think we've done a lot of teaching on what it's not. We're going to get to now what it is. We're starting to see the picture unfold from 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 20 is where we're going to pick up. Oh, that's why. And I know this is in the middle of a, of, a, of a verse, middle of a sentence. It's a really long sentence. I just want to pick up here in verse number 20. The Bible says, Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, were in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The importance of what we're getting in the context here is, this, is the reference back to Noah and the ark and the people who were saved uh, from the water because they were in the ark. Verse 21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. So what he's saying is that the, the ark salvation was a picture of salvation. And he says that's even how, like, like how baptism saves us. But then it's clear to put in this parenthetical statement here, just so that no one would get the wrong idea of going, Ha! See, I told you baptism's required for salvation, for your soul being saved. No, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It doesn't save you from the sins of your flesh. It doesn't save from that. You need Christ to redeem you from those sins of your flesh. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. And then it says, uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if we get rid of that parenthetical statement, the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. And now to go back, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Baptism will give us a good conscience toward God. 
which was the second part of that parenthetical statement in Second Peter, or First Peter, chapter three. Romans six now is going to describe a lot about how we ought to live. Okay, the first thing that happens and that needs to happen for a Christian is to believe and be born again. Okay. Once you're born again, which was the prerequisite, the requirement in order to get baptized, now you ought to get baptized. Okay, you have this new birth. And Romans chapter 6 starts off, and in fact, let's just get the tail end of Romans chapter 5, just for good measure. Let's start reading verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, he said the law was given to show us that we're unrighteous, to show us that we're sinners, to highlight that. And even though offenses have abounded, and it says where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God's grace, forgiveness of sins, is, is able to cover all sins and no matter how many sins a person has, no matter how many sins are committed, grace goes beyond the boundary of sin. It covers all. So this is clear at the end of chapter 5. Hey, Christ's payment that by one man, you know, forgiveness or grace can be shown unto all. His payment is sufficient for all, to be able to cover all sin, all people, for all ages, going, um, covering everything. Grace covers all. Grace abounds. But right away, immediately, now as we go into chapter 6, it's going to deal with this, the subject then of, well, I mean, then I guess we could just sin and it's okay. Who cares, right? Hey, we're free in Christ. God's grace just covers all of our sins, so let's just keep sinning. Why should we even bother and worry about anything? If, if I'm saved, then who cares? Wrong. Bad attitude. Not right. But it's clear that grace covers all sin. It's just going to abound. So that is a true statement. But let's read, in, uh, read that last verse there, verse 21 in, in chapter 5. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse number 1 now, chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Hey, let's just bring in more grace by sinning more. Right? Grace is a good thing. Let's just keep on adding up the grace. And say, should we just do that? Well, what does the next verse say? God forbid. God forbid. Of course we shouldn't do that. Of course. That's ridiculous. And it's, it's interesting because when we go out and talk to people about salvation, oftentimes one of, one of, the, one of the most objections, one of the, one of the most common objections I hear when you try to explain that, hey, you're saved by faith in Christ and it's not your works, it's not going to church, and that even if a person does sin and continues to sin and continues to habitually sin after they're saved, they're still saved. Because where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Amen. Well, that just means you can go off and do whatever you want. Look, it means you're still saved is what it means. But it's, we're not teaching that, well, just go ahead and do whatever you want. It's not the same thing. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We're dead to sin because we have Christ. Because Christ died on the cross for our sins. Verse 3, and I'm going to get ahead of myself here, so I'm going to just keep reading. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And this covers what baptism pictures, because baptism is a representation. It is a picture of Jesus Christ and his death and his burial and his resurrection. And I didn't cover this in depth, and I'm not going to go in depth on this, but baptism is by immersion. It's full submersion in water. It's not pouring or sprinkling or you know, doing any of this stuff with a few drops of water. It's immersion. And it's, so, it's super important for many reasons. One, that's just where the, the word we even get derives from the Greek word, which means to immerse, which there wasn't a word for. It was transliterated into English for baptism to give us a word that didn't exist, that had to be transliterated. But it's immersion. Also, we could know that and understand that because this is a picture of being baptized into his death. When Jesus was on the cross, he was vertical, upright, right? When a person gets down into the water, whatever body of water that is to get baptized, they're standing upright. When we baptize a person, they go under the water. Well, Jesus was buried in a tomb under the earth, right? In a grave. And then the third day, what happened? He rose again from the dead. Now, thank God, baptism is a lot quicker than that. We don't hold you underwater for three days and three nights. We pull you right back up again <laughs> just in an instant because it's just a picture, yeah. right? It's just a representation. We're not reenacting a death, burial, and resurrection fully with the time frame. But we're showing you, and, and what the person is doing is they're showing outwardly their faith by that baptism. I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for my salvation. So what you're doing is you're outwardly expressing that faith by getting buried in baptism, brought back up, representing the resurrection from the dead. And what this is teaching in Romans 6 is that, hey, we are living for the resurrection. We know there's a resurrection. We're done with the old life. We're done with the old man. We're done with that first birth, with that carnal birth, with that first, with the flesh. We're done with that. We're going to walk now in the spirit because we're born again. We've got a new man. We've got that new spirit. We're going to walk spiritually. We're going to do what's right. And that baptism shows the picture of that, but it's also a reminder, not just for the person getting baptized, but for every single one of us on how we ought to live our life. So as we see a new life come in this world, a spiritual life that's getting baptized, we ought to be able to say, hey, I need to walk in newness of life. I need to remember my spiritual birth and get back into walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lusts of the flesh. Baptism's important. So it's important for everybody, not just the person being baptized, but for all of us around to continue doing the baptisms as a reminder. And I'm going to teach on this. I teach this on a yearly basis, at least, making sure we're all clear what baptism is because it's super important. It, I mean, we're called Baptists, right? It's important. We're of the Baptist faith. Let's keep reading. So, and notice there in verse 4, we'll read verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism in the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And I just want to point out, it doesn't say you automatically will walk in newness of life. It says we should. Every day we have a choice to make. We still have the old man. We still have the first birth. We still have the flesh that wars against the spirit. And we have to choose whether we're going to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh every day. Which is why we still sin, because we, st we, we falter. We, we, we end up finding ourselves in the flesh. No, no, we need to walk in the spirit. But there's no guarantee that you're going to be walking in the spirit afterwards. We should be walking in the spirit, though. We should be continuing to think about these things and choosing these things. And people want to try to tell you, oh, well, if you do this sin or you do that sin, or you, if, you're, if you're still a drunk after you got saved and you didn't really get saved, you know what? Hogwash. If a person puts their faith in Christ and is trusting them as their Savior alone, they're saved. Amen. And you know what? From that moment forward, they should walk 
in newness of life. Amen. They should. But until we leave this corrupt, wretched body that we have, this sinful body that drives us into lust, we won't be without sin. We won't be free from the bondage of this own body that wants to drive us into sin. But thank God, being born again, you have a spirit. Not only do you have your new, the new man, which is that born again spirit inside of you, you also have the Holy Spirit to help lead you and guide you and direct you into all knowledge and wisdom. So that's a kind of a double bonus there. Uh, let's keep reading a little bit more here. Verse number five. For if we had been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. That the crucifixion of Christ on the cross, his physical body, is, is the destruction of our body of sin. Remember, he became sin for us, the Bible says. And that bodily flesh died on the cross. Now, the resurrection gives us a transfigured or a transformed or a changed body. We will have a body at the resurrection, but it's going to be updated, upgraded, right? It's a body 2.0. It's going to be a much better body that is not sinful, that is not weak, that is not of our current carnal flesh. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin, because we're dead in Christ. We're free from that corruption of the body under God's law, because Christ satisfied the penalty of the law. Verse 8, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. You know, the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died once. He died once. That one death covers all sin. He doesn't need to die over and over and over again to pay for our sins. You don't need to receive Christ over and over and over and over again to pay for your sins. He pays for your sins the one time you put your trust in him. That covers all of it. You should walk in newness of life as a daily thing. But that death was a one-time payment that covers all. And where sin abounded, grace doth much more abound. Verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Again, if it was an automatic thing, he wouldn't tell you not to let it happen. <laughs> it just makes sense, right? That also shows us it is possible for sin to reign in our mortal bodies if you allow it to. We need to strengthen our spirit and weaken our flesh, mortify our flesh. Neither, verse 13, yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Baptism. There's a great point to get right in your life, to get right with God, to say, hey, I am going to put my flesh to death, and I'm going to walk in that spirit and walk in that resurrection and walk in that newness of life after getting baptized. And look, if you haven't been baptized yet, I encourage you to do so. I know for myself personally, you know, I got saved when I was 20 years old. I was, it was about six or seven years later by the time I was actually baptized. But the baptism was a pivotal moment in my life where I was saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to just do what, I'm going to try to do what's right from now. I'm going to actually make a concerted effort and focus on serving the Lord, getting in church, and doing what's right. And that happened, man, after the baptism, it was like, that's when I really got plugged in. And that kind of helped cement it for me of having that, that carnal death and the spiritual walk, that spiritual rebirth. I, I was saved when I was 20. And, I, and, you know, even if I never got baptized, I'd always be saved. But... It's, it's a moment 
that is significant. It has spiritual power. Okay, that baptism, you ought to get baptized if you haven't been. So, um, a couple more verses, and we'll wrap it up here. Neither yield to yourselves, verse 13. Uh, members as instruments on righteousness and the sin, but yield yourselves unto God, as those are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. He brings up the same thing again. Should we continue in sin? No. Shall we sin? We're not, look, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, as servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. And this is the reminder which is in the baptism. The death to sin, death to carnality, death to the old life and walking in newness of life through the Spirit. This is why we baptize people. One, it's a commandment. Two, it's got a lot of spiritual implications in its meaning. It is not required for salvation, but rather is a picture of our salvation and what we ought to do. As born-again believers, we need to daily be making the, the serious effort to walk in the Spirit not giving in to the lusts of our flesh. If you're not, if, if you are not saved today, please speak to me, one of the ushers, after service. We would like to show you how to be saved. If you are saved and have not been baptized after your salvation, and I didn't cover this in the sermon, but I'll, I'll just say this real quickly. I was, I was baptized as a baby. I wasn't saved as a baby. I told you I was saved when I was 20. That baptism doesn't count. I didn't even choose that baptism. It was just done for me, okay? The prerequisite, as we saw in Acts chapter 8, was to believe. Hey, I'm not going to baptize you unless you believe. If you were an unbeliever, if you were mixed up, if you didn't understand salvation in the past, and maybe you went to other church, other, what, just some other place, and you got baptized, and you're believing in what they were teaching, you're believing in their doctrine, but their doctrine told you that, hey, you, you could lose your salvation, or, you, you know, if you weren't right, if you weren't saved by completely trusting in Christ, then anything that happened before that doesn't count. Okay? Get baptized. And if you have any doubt about it in your mind, there's nothing wrong with getting baptized again. Now, we don't need to. If, if, you, if you were saved and you got baptized one time after salvation, that's all you need. That's sufficient. But if you have your own doubts and, and going, man, I don't really know. I know I was saved, but I got baptized under this circumstance or that circumstance. It's not a big deal to get baptized again right. at all, especially if that's a, a personal conviction for you. I always instruct people, hey, even if the person's unsaved is baptizing, if you got baptized after you were saved, I still think that's fine and that's good and that works because it's all about your submission, obedience, and demonstrating your faith. Even if the person, because what do we ever, do we ever see anything about the person actually performing the baptism? That they have any importance at all in that process other than someone has to do it? Not really. I mean, so that they don't have this image or representation of anything in what we're doing with baptism. So if that were to happen, I would still say, hey, your, your baptism stands. But. Um, no, get bap if you need to get baptized, let's get baptized today. We've got plenty of, uh, of garments. Hopefully that water is warm. We've had a lot of issues with the uh, water heater, but I probably shouldn't even be saying that right now. I'm trying to encourage you to get baptized. We have <laughs> Either way, it won't last very long. You're in and out. We'll, we'll get this taken care of quickly. So uh, come and speak to me immediately after service. Uh, if you are not the one individual who's getting baptized today, but you would like to get baptized, come and see me right away. Uh, we're going to close with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for um, these great teachings. We thank you for salvation and the simplicity in Christ, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help us to lead more people to Christ. I pray that you please help us all to reflect on our uh, spiritual man that's inside of us, that spiritual birth that we have, dear Lord, and that you would um, help us all to just, in our own hearts and minds, be um, 
convinced to, to walk in our spirit and to move forward that way and that as we, as we see one more profession of faith by, by um, the representation of Christ that we're going to see today that we would also just renew our own um, willingness to walk in the newness of the spirit. Dear God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.